it's been a crazy week. A uh, couple of days were totally shot. Coulter fell down up here, smashed his face, ripped his lip wide open, and he had to go in for plastic surgery on Wednesday. Like, it was insane. So, needless to say, it's been a bit of a crazy week, and I'm super stoked my parents are here visiting me. And, uh, but I didn't work yesterday because I wanted to spend time with them. So anyways, that I'm feeling a little unprepared, but one thing I do know, please come again. Don't take me wrong. <laughs> one thing I do know, God has called me his child, and God has called me to proclaim his good news. I know those two things are true, and so that's what I'm going to do, and maybe God will show up. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this morning. I thank you for your word and just the amazing truths that we find in it. God, I pray that as we look at a story and we, and we read through it and we listen and we learn, I pray that we can unpack it and that your spirit is here to help us understand some truths today, some truths about our life and about what you've done for us, God, and who you want us to be in Christ. So I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. It's Super Bowl Sunday, and I didn't do this on purpose. I'm really honestly not that clever. But I was talking to a guy on Thursday, and he's like, oh, that's funny. It's Super Bowl Sunday. I'm like, really? Oh, that's kind of funny. Anyways, I'm going to teach you guys how to throw Hail Mary today on Super Bowl Sunday. All right? And if any of you, who here knows what a Hail Mary pass is? Okay, so I'm not talking about the Hail Mary prayer that you would do in Catholic Church, although that is kind of where the name came from. So I'm not knocking the prayer or anything like that. It has nothing to do with the prayer. It's the Hail Mary pass. Okay, and if any of you have seen me throw a football before, it's a little sketchy. It's, it's hard to catch because if I get any distance on it at all, it, uh, I got a brutal spiral. I got to work on the spiral. But anyways, the, where the, the, Hail Perry, the Hail Mary Pass name came from was back in December 28th, 1975, a playoff game between the Cowboys and the Vikings in the NFL, okay? And it was a tight game. The, the Cowboys were down by four points. It was 10-14 in the fourth quarter, 35 seconds left on the clock, and they were 70 yards out. They had one play left. The chances of them winning that win in the game was slim to none. So Roger Staubach, the quarterback, brings his team together and he's like, boys, we got one last chance. We got to make a Hail Mary. We got to throw this thing. Crazy. And maybe it'll work. And so they do. Roger's back there, hut, takes the hut, and he steps back and he throws this huge long bomb, 50-yard pass. And the guy catches it and, and runs the other 20. Touchdown, they win the game, and they go to the, they, they carry on in the playoffs. And after the game, it was such a crazy play, and it shouldn't have happened, like, all of, like, in, in, there was no probability of this thing working out. And, uh, and the people came up after, and they're asking Roger, like, man, what were you thinking when you threw that pass? He's like, oh, I wasn't th- saying anything. I closed my eyes and said a Hail Mary, and I chucked the ball. And that's where the Hail Mary came from, from Roger Staubach, 1975, playoff game on December 28th. And so, basically, the name Hail Mary in football, the only way that it's going to work is if there's divine intervention. Right? Like, <laughs> you know football players, how, and any sports players, how, um, how, what's the word I'm looking for? Help me out superstitious thank you they're super superstitious like they wear ridiculous rally caps and and all this kind of stuff but the only way that a hail mary pass is going to work basically is if there's a divine intervention and it's going to work so now i'm not actually going to teach you guys how to throw a hail mary pass but i believe in life we do throw hail marys and if you haven't yet you're going to have to one day throw a Hail Mary pass. And what I mean by that is there's times in life where there's pressure like pinching in on us and the things in life are just so difficult and there's stuff that we have to do and things that need to get done but it looks like there's no way that it's ever going to work out in our favor. Right? Where we're, we're in a situation or a circumstance where we are stuck. There's no way that we're going to win this fight, that we're going to win this battle. 
And so th- there's times where all of us are going to have to do that. And just for, just for an example, um, you know, if you're in a situation and, and you don't know what to say to somebody, they're hurt and they're broken, and you're like, duh, I want to help them out. What am I going to say in this time right now? Or, or um, you know, if you have two job opportunities and you've got to pick one, and you've got to pick one quick, uh, which one do you pick? Which one's going to be the best? Right? That, that doesn't seem too difficult, but sometimes it is difficult. You want to honor God with your work, and so which one do you pick? Um, or you're, you're going to crash. Which way do you turn? Or your health is on the line, and there is a few options for your health, but some of them are more risky than others, but may have better results. Do you take that risk? Right? Do, you, do you take the long bomb pass on your health, hoping that maybe it'll work out? Or maybe you're going into school and there's two schools you need to choose from. Or maybe there's a business opportunity for your business to grow, but it requires a bit of risk, like a bit of a Hail Mary, and you don't know if you should do it so that your business will grow. Or um, some of our marriages, man, they're on the rocks. right? Relationships and marriages are just getting attacked day and night. Men make ridiculous decisions and hurt the women. And women, the same thing back. We're hurting each other. And so we're stuck in this place where it feels like we got one last effort, one last ditch effort that we can put in to maybe bring our, our marriage back. So what is it you're going to do on that last ditch effort in your marriage? Right? Or, or maybe it's you have a heart for your town. And your town's suffering sucking wind. People are getting laid off. People are broken and hurting and they're addicted to drugs and alcohol and horrible things are happening. You have a heart for your town and it seems like there's no hope. Like what is that last ditch effort that you could do to maybe have an impact in your community? Or even if you are struggling with sex or drugs or alcohol or food and it's a hard battle and every time you're tempted, you fail. And you, get, you lose to that enemy that's coming in. Your addiction. How do you fight that? What's your last ditch effort that you can do to actually win that battle? Right? You've got you to throw a Hail Mary sometimes in life. And so we're going to look at what that means today. So when you do throw a Hail Mary, the outcomes always hang on the, on the maybe. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it'll work out. Maybe things will be good. Maybe I will get better. Maybe we won't be broke next month. Maybe my son or my daughter will just snap out of it and start listening to me and turn back to the Lord. Right? Maybe maybe just if I chuck the ball into the end zone, somebody will catch it and the play will be a success. Maybe. Well, I um, I want to turn in the Old Testament today and I want to look at a guy and his life in a situation that he was in where he had to throw a Hail Mary. He was in a time of desperation and he had to make a move. He had to make a decision quickly and he had to do something. And it truly was a Hail Mary. And this story is about Jonathan and his armor bearer. And you'll find his story in 1 Samuel chapter 14. If you want to grab your Bible or your phone or your app, or there should be a Bible in front of you, in the seat in front of you, a blue one. You can grab that. Open it up to 1 Samuel chapter 14. <clears throat> and so while you're turning there, I want to give you, I want to set the story up a little bit so you know what, what the situation is that Jonathan's in. Okay, so Jonathan is the son of the king, King Saul. So Jonathan is the prince of Israel. He's an important dude. So him, him and his uh, dad, they find themselves going into battle. But before this battle happens, King Saul, he appoints and he picks out 3,000 of the best men in Israel. And that's his army. He's got 3,000 troops. And he trains them and, and gets them ready for battle. And, uh, and so he's picked 3,000 men. And these are the strongest, most courageous men in the land. Uh, but there's major problems right out of the gate for this army. First problem is the Philistines, who's the enemy that they're going to battle, the Philistines come and raid Israel. They, they send people over at night and they raid Israel. They steal all of their weapons and they steal their blacksmiths. 
so that they can't make weapons anymore. So they steal their most important people when it comes to battling, preparing for the war, because the blacksmiths need to make the weapons. So they steal the weapons, they steal the blacksmiths, and they take them away. And now Israel's stuck with no weapons, nothing. So what do they do? <laughs> um, listen to this, chapter 13, verse 20. Where are we at? 13, 20. Here we go. So on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people with Saul and Jonathan. Only Saul and Jonathan had these weapons. And it also says here, um, Now there's no blacksmith to be found in all of the land, lest the Hebrews make themselves swords or spears. But every one of the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen his plowshare his mattock, his axe, or his sickle. And the charge was two-thirds of a shekel for the plowshare and for the mattocks, and a third of a she shekel for sharpening the axes and for setting the goads. <laughs> this is ridiculous. So, so you <laughs> the Philistines come and raid the Israelites, all of their weapons and their blacksmiths. The Israelites have nothing. So they're like, oh, well, let's just grab all of our farming tools and we'll go over to the Philistines and have them sharpen them. It's ridiculous. The Philistines have the upper hand right off the bat. They're charging the Israelites to sharpen their weapons for the battle that they're going to lose. Brutally. It's kind of funny. <laughs> um, okay, so they steal their stuff, charge the Israelites to sharpen their farming tools that they're going to fight with. Second thing, not only do they have no weapons, they're outnumbered. Brutally. So that, remember, the Israelites have 3,000 men. Okay? And then if you look at 13, uh, verse 5, it says this, And the Philistines mustered to fight with Israel 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen and troops like the sand on the seashore in multitude. So, <laughs> the Israelites have 3,000 and the Philistines have like 70,000 men. It's completely ridiculous. And they're going into battle. Third crappy thing for the Israelites, if we look in verse 6, chapter 13, verse 6, where are we at here? When the men of Israel saw that they were in trouble, <laughs> for the people were hard-pressed, the people hid themselves in caves and in holes and in rocks and in tombs and in cisterns. And some Hebrews crossed the fords of the Jordan to the land of Gad and Gilead. So 3,000 men, no weapons other than farming tools, and they're going into battle and all the Israel Israelites get scared because they see this huge gigantic army that shakes the earth when it moves. And they start hiding in holes and caves and rocks and cisterns and tombs. Like all these guys are scared for their lives. And, and they lose almost the whole army. And so they're completely outnumbered. And if you read, if we read down a little bit, it talks about how Saul only has 600 men left. 600 against 70,000 with no weapons. This ain't good. It's not going to go good. So you would think. <laughs> Okay, so Jonathan, in this, Jonathan knows that he's got to throw a Hail Mary. He's got to do something, and it's going to be crazy. All the odds are stacked up against him, but he's got to do something. And so, chapter 14, verse 1, let's read together and see what Jonathan does. One day, Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man, who carried his armor. Come, let us go over to the Philistine garrison on the other side. But he did not tell his father. Saul was staying in the outskirts of Gibba in the pomegranate cave at Migron. The people who were with him were about 600. So Jonathan has this plan, and he wants to go over to the garrison where the Philistines are. And when he does, he tells his armor bearer. So just the fact that Jonathan has an armor bearer means that he is a very important man. He's likely a general or a commander in the army. 
Because what happens is, if you're a general or a commander, you need to lead people. So when you're trying to muster them up and encourage them and inspire them and lead them, and you got your <clears throat> maps out and you're trying to figure everything out, you need an armor bearer with you so that he can take all your stuff and hold it for you, right beside you, while you're doing your leadership and your planning. And then when you're ready for battle, he, he gives it to you and helps you put it on and everything. So, that's, so Jonathan's an important guy. Prince of Israel, commander, or general in this army. And so he didn't want to tell anybody what he was doing because he knew if he did, they would think he's stupid. They would think he's absolutely insane. There's no way you're doing that, Jonathan. If you go do that, you're going to get yourself killed. So Jonathan didn't tell anybody. He just knew that he had to go with his armor bear and do something. And so we carry on. Go halfway down uh, verse 3. And the people did not know that Jonathan had gone. Within the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistine garrison, there was a rocky crag on one side and a rocky crag on the other side. The name of the one was Boses, and the name of the other, Sinna. The one crag rose the north, uh, to the north in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Geba. So, so Jonathan, as he's going in here, it's just him and his armor bearer, they're in a really good position. If, you're, if you've ever seen a movie on battle or anything where there's like just a few men fighting a whole horde of people, like I don't know if you've seen 300, it's kind of gnarly, but um, <laughs> they hide themselves in like a narrow valley, right? Or like a small um, ravine. And that's exactly where Jonathan and his armor bearer are right now. They're positioned well. If they were to have two men fight against a whole bunch, they're pr- positioned well because the men would have to come in and you, can, you can only fight one or two at a time when it's that narrow. So they're in a good position right now. And then the story continues. <clears throat> Jonathan, Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised uncircumcised. Awesome. (laughs) Talk about circumcision for a minute. (laughs) So when he says the uncircumcised, he's making a point. He's not slamming them because they're uncircumcised. But what he is doing is he's pointing out that their enemy that they're going after right now is not circumcised, which means they don't believe in the God of Israel. They don't trust in the God of Israel. They don't follow after him. They don't listen to him. They don't abide by his laws. They don't have any faith in him. And God will not work for those people. Because circumcision was a symbol of a promise that God made in Genesis chapter 17 to Abraham. He said, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. And the sign of this is circumcision. So he made a promise, and the sign of the promise was circumcision. So he's talking about how these men do not fall under the promise of God. And God is not going to be on their side. But he is on our side. So let's go. So, we carry on with the story. Jonathan said to the young man who carried his armor, Come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing can hinder the Lord from saving by many or by few. Maybe. Maybe, he says. Maybe the Lord will work for us. Maybe the Lord will show up. This is the key ingredient to the Hail Mary. In life, this is the key ingredient to the maybe. Right? If, we just, if you just read over it quickly, it could seem like Jonathan maybe doesn't have all that much faith. He's doubting a little bit. Like, ah, oh, man, maybe God will show up. But that's not it at all. Okay, if you think about him, he's already committed to this crazy plan. He's got his armor bear. They're going through this ravine, and they're going to step out. And right before he does, he's like, okay, we've done everything that we can do. There's really nothing else that we can do. We have skills. We're called to do this. We're called to lead this army. We can't. We're stepping out in faith, and we're going to do something crazy. And we're going to put our life on the line. I'm willing to die for this thing. And in that, maybe God will show up. And so, 
I want to explain something to you here really quick. Um, the difference between a good idea and a God idea. Some of you may have heard this before. The difference between a good idea and a God idea. A good idea is where you can actually go and plan something on your own. Even It might be a little bit lofty, but if you play your cards right, if you're a skilled person and you know that all of your skills and your attributes and your character lines up with this goal that you're trying to accomplish, and you get a team around you of people that have awesome skills and abilities and talents that line up with this good idea, and you have enough resources to throw at it, that good idea is going to be a success. Very high probability that it will be. And the difference in a God idea is that this, it's another lofty idea, and you're going into it, and yes, you do have skills, yes, you do have talents and abilities and gifts that God's given you to go and do this task, but the difference in the God idea is that there's no way that it will ever possibly work out unless God shows up. It won't. It'll fail. You cannot hang your maybe on your own skills when it's a God idea. When it's a God-sized vision, you can't. You can put everything you want into it, but you know it won't work out unless God, the Holy Spirit, shows up and does a work and works for you in that moment. That's the difference between a good idea and a God idea. And, And you know what? Like, It makes sense if you think about it because God, God wants glory. He wants to be glorified on the earth. Not because he's narcissistic, but because he wants everybody around the world to know him. And if he's able to glorify himself through us, people around us will see that and they will know that God is real and true. And his gospel is true. And so when God is able to work in order to be glorified, he has to do it in such a way where only the glory could be given to him. When, it, when you go through a situation in life, and the only way that you can explain that it was a success is because of God. You have to mention God. That is a God-sized idea. And that's how God works. He wants to be glorified through you. And so the story carries on. This is awesome. I love this part. Okay. So he says, let's go. Maybe God will work for us. Maybe God will show up. And his armor bearer said to him, this is what his armor bearer says. This is awesome. And his armor bearer said to him, do all that is in your heart. Do as you wish. Behold, I am with you heart and soul. I am with you heart and soul. This is a faithful, faithful man. A faithful follower. And I truly admire this man and I, and I admire his friendship and his relationship with his leader. But like, not only does this man have faith in God, but he has faith in his leader. And they must have an awesome relationship because think about it. This armor bearer, if he was working there grudgingly, or just because he had to, he would have said something like, yeah, yeah, you bet, I'll, I'll bring it up the rear for you. Yeah, because, uh, you know, I, I'm getting paid and I, I got to do this. For sure, I'm, whew, I'm with you. No, he doesn't say that. He says, I'm with you, heart and soul. Everything he's got, he's going to put into this one battle and he's following Jonathan and the vision that Jonathan has and the plan that Jonathan has, even though it's nuts. The armor bearer is all in. And then, then Jonathan said, Behold, we will cross over to the men and we will show ourselves to them. If they say to us, wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and we will not go to them. But if they say, come to us, then we will go up for the Lord has given them into our hands and this shall be a sign to us. So, again, you can read that and kind of see maybe Jonathan, he's testing the Lord. You know, he's throwing out the fleece and seeing if it's going to get wet or dry because he's asking for a sign or he's saying that there's going to be a sign. But if you do any, any type of reading into this at all, any commentaries or people that have studied this, it's not that way at all. It's not that at all. Um, I believe that this whole thing, in reading some stuff, I believe that Jonathan was inspired and led by God right from the get-go. Because this is such a crazy plan. 
And so he was led right from the get-go. And they're standing there ready to go and attack. And I believe that he was given insight into how he could know. And God was like strengthening his faith in this moment right before he was going to step onto the battlefield. And so I don't think it was a doubt or testing or anything. It was, it was God, the Holy Spirit, giving Jonathan some insight and strengthening his faith in this moment. This pivotal moment of decision. And so they carried out the plan. So both of them showed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Look, Hebrews are coming out of their holes where they have hidden themselves. (laughs) Because remember they were hiding in the holes and cisterns and stuff? Okay. And uh, and the men of the garrison hailed Jonathan and his armor bearer and said, Come up to us and we will show you a thing. (laughs) And Jonathan said to his armor bearer, Come up after me, for the Lord has given them into the hand of Israel. And Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet, and his armor bearer after him. Okay, just real quick. I don't have this written down or anything, but think about it. So they just climbed up out of this rocky crag thing. And they're not in the ravine anymore. They're completely exposed. They just gave up their position. Because they were... They, that was the sign. They had to do that. They weren't standing still in the, waiting for all the... They had to go and attack. So they're not on the defense. They're actually attacking this huge crowd of dudes. This is even crazier that they would give up their good position because they had so much bold faith that God was going to work for them. Then Jonathan climbed up on his hands and feet and his armor bearer after him and they fell before Jonathan and his armor bearer killed them after him. And that first strike with Jonathan and his armor bearer made killed about 20 men within, as it were, half a furrow's length in an acre of land. And there was a panic in the camp, in the field, and among all the people, the garrison, and even the raiders trembled. The earth quaked, and it became a very great panic. Now that's not a coincidence that the earth just quakes out of nowhere. <laughs> Just so happens they're attacking two against 70,000 and the earthquakes. Come on. God showed up. Okay. And the watchman of Saul in Geba of Benjamin looked, and behold, this is the end of the story. The multitude was dispersing here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count and see who has gone from us. And they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor bearer were not there. So Saul said to Ahijah, (laughs) bring the ark of God here. For the ark of God went at that time with the people of Israel. Now while Saul was talking to the priest, um, the tumult in the camp of the Philistines increased more and more. So Saul said to the priest, withdraw your hand. Then Saul and all the people who were with him rallied and went into battle. 600 dudes going into battle. And behold, every Philistine's sword was against his fellow. And there was a great confusion. 600 men running at 70,000 and the 70,000 guys are killing themselves because they're all confused and they don't know what's going on. And then now the Hebrews who had been with the Philistines before that time and who had gone up with them into camp, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. All of the blacksmiths and everybody that got raided and stolen out of the city that were now working for the Philistines, they revolted and went and attacked Israel as well. Sorry, not Israel. Attacked the Philistines with the Israelites. So you have the dudes, the blacksmiths fighting now. Okay. Likewise, when all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim heard that the Philistines were fleeing, they too followed hard after them in battle. So all the scared guys come up out of their holes and start attacking as well. So now you've got maybe 4,000 guys fighting against 70,000. And so the Lord saved Israel that day and the battle passed beyond beth And that's the end of the story. <clears throat> it's incredible... Um, how God works sometimes. I mean, obviously, he showed up there. He caused an earthquake. He caused mass confusion amongst the, the enemy. And they're fighting themselves. And in that, God had to get the glory. There's no other way to tell the story. God got the glory. Okay. Now, has anything like that, maybe a little smaller scale, ever happened in your life? <coughs> Where 
where you have a story that you could tell today that's part of your testimony that would say, I was in this and the only way I got out was because God showed up. It's the only way. Um, like how many of you could agree with me when I say that God sometimes seems like the God of the 11th hour and the 59th minute? Right? Like he, he just, it's, it's crazy. He like waits to the last minute. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what's going on. We don't know. Ah, oh, okay. Finally he shows up and things happen. Kind of like, okay, pretend you're Batman and you're in the bat car. Boom, you're driving down 90 miles an hour and you go into the bat cave and it's this stone wall and you don't slow down. You can't, so there's no brakes, there's only gas. And you're going 90 miles an hour, in the last split second, boom, the rock opens and then you go in. And you're safe. You don't crash. It's crazy how often God works like that. He works like that all the time. And, uh, and he does that because it strengthens your faith. Next time you'll be more content and more faithful and more steadfast and understand and know how God works. And in that, you can't tell the story and give yourself glory. I'm so awesome, I worked it out and I opened up the rock wall so I didn't smack. No. The only way you can tell it is if you give God the glory. And he does that all the time. It's, uh, it's awesome. And so, if we think of this story with Jonathan and how God showed up and worked for them, I believe that there's, there's a few things that we can pull out and learn from Jonathan. Okay, and, and so... Two of these things have to do with character, and two of these things have to do with commitment. Commitment and character. There's two commitments that you need to make before you make that Hail Mary pass, or that last ditch effort of desperation in your life, that last split, split second decision. There's two commitments you need to make. And in those two commitments, there's two character traits that you need to have when you make those. Okay. So let's explain this. You need to have a soft heart. You need to have a soft heart. A soft heart is absolutely essential. So naturally, all of us have a hard heart. When we hear things about God and about creation and about um, how he works and about the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus and how Jesus is God and how he's coming back again one day and how the only way you can get to heaven is through Jesus, otherwise you're going to hell. And when you hear that stuff, naturally we have a hard heart and those truths hit our heart and they ricochet off like shooting a rifle at a rock. That's naturally what our hearts are like. We don't like the truth of God. It seems simple and stupid and foolish. And so it doesn't penetrate. It just ricochets right off. But if we want to have anything from God, if we want to have anything to do with God, any type of relationship, we need to come before him with a soft heart. Okay? We need to come before him and repenting and, and like falling on our faces and just giving him all of our junk and all of our sin and all of our disobedience to him that, that sets up this rock wall between us. And so we need a soft heart. And, and so when you fall before him, this is what God promises. He says this in Ezekiel 36 verse 25. I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean from all your uncleanliness and from all your idols I will cleanse you and I will give you a new heart, a, a new heart, a new spirit, and I will put within you a new spirit. And I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you. It's only God that can give you that soft heart. That heart that can understand anything that he says. And it requires a great deal of humility and conviction and you need to humble yourself before the Lord and get right with Him and ask Him to be in your life and lead your life. And He will give you that heart of flesh where His truths can penetrate. You need to have a soft heart. That is essential. Absolutely essential. Second thing, character, you need to have a broken spirit. You need to have a broken spirit. Psalm 51 verse 17 says this, The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, O God, you will not despise. This is huge. This is King David writing, and he's not talking about somebody that's like broken and beat up and they feel like crap and they're hurting and they're sad and they're depressed and things are really hard in life. Although that is very real and God loves you and he wants good for you, 
David is talking about something a little bit different here. A broken spirit. Let me explain it to you. How many of you here are horse people? How many? Yeah, let's see some hands. Horse people. Horsey. Okay, we got a few. Cerise is not here. Now, if you know anything about horses, you have to break them. Right? And if you don't ride horses, you know that you have to break a horse. It needs to be broke for riding. Before you hop on that thing and actually think you're going to go and do some work that's useful with it, that horse needs to be broken. And it takes time and effort and energy, and you need to break the spirit of that horse so that it will submit to you, so that horse will have a soft mouth. I should have Mark up here explaining it, not me. That horse needs to have a soft mouth. It needs to listen. It needs to be alert and attentive. And it needs to follow you and the signals you're giving it so that it will listen and do work for you that you need it to do. That is the broken spirit that David is talking about. He's talking about that your will needs to be broken. That you are not the master of your own domain. And instead of kicking against the will of God all the time and bucking him off, You need to submit and have a broken spirit before him. That doesn't mean you're any weaker or any of your skills are different or anything like that. You are willing to submit to him and his call on your life so that he can use you and steer your life. There's a a huge difference if King Saul, if you read any more in here, chapter 15, 16, you'll see that King Saul, Jonathan's dad, he's brutal. He doesn't have a broken spirit at all. He's very proud, and God will tell him to do something and how to do it and when to do it, and then he won't do it the same way. He'll do it his own way and when he wants, all the time. And he actually ends up getting the kingdom ripped out of his hands and given to King David later. And it's because Saul didn't have a broken spirit before the Lord. And so God couldn't work through him the way that he wanted to. God wasn't getting the glory. Saul was, King Saul. But in Jonathan's situation, Jonathan had a broken spirit and a soft heart. He knew God's truths and he was willing to be used by God the way that God wanted to use him. So you need to have a broken spirit like a broke horse. And so with those two characteristics, you need to commit your life to the Lord with a soft heart and a broken spirit. And you do this, like I said, by repenting of your sin and trusting in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And then the second commitment that you need to make is you need to commit your work to him. Commit your work to him. Proverbs 16 says this, The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. All the ways of a man are pure in his own eyes, but the Lord weighs the spirit. Commit your work to the Lord, and your plans will be established. You need to commit your work to the Lord. As his child, you should commit everything to him. Remember when I said that Jonathan was the prince of Israel? He's the prince of Israel. That is who he was. And he was called to a specific work. This is who you are. This is what you're going to do. You are a son of God. You're going to go and be a commander of my army. That was his... That's who he was and what he was doing. Both of his callings. He was called as a child of God and he was called as a commander of the army. He knew that that was his work. And so he committed his work to the Lord. And he went out and he did everything that he could in his own possible power. And he committed all of his skills, all of his training, all of his experience. He committed it to the work of the Lord. And it's because of that God was able to use him. And God helped him in this time where he, there was, all the odds were stacked against him and he was throwing a Hail Mary. So before you throw a Hail Mary, you need to commit your life to God and commit your work to God. And you need to do it with a soft heart and a broken spirit. And, and how, can, how can we be sure of all this? Like, how can all this be true? How can all this really work in our lives? It's because there's a better Jonathan. There's a better Jonathan. And like Jonathan, he was a prince. But he wasn't the prince of Israel. He was the prince of heaven. And this prince of heaven, he came down and he fought for his people. Just like Jonathan fought for his people that day. Jesus is the prince of heaven. 
And he came down here to this earth to fight a fight that seemed like could never, ever be won. All the odds were stacked up against him. And he was entering into this battle against evil. He was entering it in, against evil. And his life was committed to God. And that commitment blessed us. His life, Jesus' life was fully committed to God and that blessed us. His work was fully committed to God and we were blessed by that. And his soft heart, he had a soft heart for God and he had a soft heart for us. And that soft heart, a spear went through his side and pierced that soft heart and his heart bled for us. And though his spirit wasn't broken, his body was broken for you and I. Jesus. And he went out on that battlefield that day, all on his own, completely abandoned, and he was crushed for our iniquities. And in that, hanging on the cross, he absorbed all of God's wrath. God has a serious wrath for sin, and God wants to crush all of sin. And Jesus took all that sin upon himself and was crushed for you and I, taking our sin away from us and giving us his righteousness. God gives you freely the righteousness of Jesus if you believe in him and follow him. And so Jesus committed his life and his work to God and he had a soft heart for the Lord and for us and he bled for us and died for us and was broken. And it seemed like all was lost but on the third day he rose, conquering sin and Satan and death and extending to us eternal life. And it's because of that truth that we can be called to action with God. We can rest in him. We know that we are secure. Our eternity doesn't have to be a Hail Mary pass. It is true. It is done. It's a fact. It's guaranteed. There's no maybe in that. You don't have to say, well, maybe I'll go to heaven. You don't have to say that at all. That's not a Hail Mary. You just put your faith in Jesus Christ and it's guaranteed you will go to heaven for all of eternity. And because of that, God calls us into action. And Jesus says to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And so if you are a Christian and you love God and you've given your life to Him, all of your work every day should be working towards that mission that God has. If, if Jesus is the better Jonathan, that means we are the armor bearer. We're in it heart and soul, man. Jesus, if you love Sparwood so much and you want to go out there and save some people, we're behind you. We want to follow your lead, heart and soul. We're willing to do anything. We're willing to die. Sacrifice anything. So commit your work to the Lord. God is looking for a few good men and a few good women. Jonathan says, nothing can stop the Lord. He can do anything, even if it's a few against many. And so he's looking for a few good men and a few good women who have committed their life and their work to him. And he's going to change this valley. You know what? If we commit to him, maybe he'll show up. Maybe he'll work for us. Let's pray. I'm going to invite the team up. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you that we can turn and look at Jonathan and, and learn from his bold faith that seemed crazy. But Lord, he trusted in you and you worked for him on that day. God, I thank you that you sent Jesus down here to do an incredible work for us, a work that we couldn't do, saving our own souls. But we thank you that you give us eternal life because of what Jesus did. And Lord, I pray that each one of us here in this room can commit our lives to you and that we can say with all certainty that we are secure for all eternity in heaven with you. It's not a Hail Mary at all. We trust you. We know that that's a fact and true. God, and you've accomplished it for us. God, and I pray that we would commit our work to you. God, that everything that we would do each and every day, we would commit to you. God, that you would get the glory, not us. 
and that we would see a huge change through our whole valley. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.